the legislators, all of them believe they are helping. They all go to, whether it's going to Sacramento here in California or Washington, D.C., they will go with the idea, with the intent that they're helping. Yet the majority of them have never, ever ran a business. They've never made a payroll. They've never signed the front of a payroll check. They've never had to deal with cash flow. And so as a result, they pass legislation without really digging into understanding the consequences and how it impacts small business. So I would say their intent is good. However, quite often the outcome is not what they expect, does not necessarily help small business move forward and achieve its goals. Hello everyone, I'm Rishi Katz and welcome to The Oval Table, where we discuss all things related to helping those who live and work within your business, how to survive, thrive, avoid pitfalls, have more fun and become successful faster. Getting advice and input from someone outside of your business can make a big difference. And that's what we seek to do for you each and every week. Here at The Oval Table, we believe that every voice matters and we want to model how that works Often the advice that makes the difference comes from where you least expect it. We seek every week to provide a lens for a different way to do business. So much more is possible when everyone's ideas make it to the table. Let me introduce you to our co-hosts, Vaughn Johnson, Doug Bowers, and Carl Walsh. What do you guys have for our listeners this week? Well, if you've been listening to the news and paying attention at all to what's going on in the world, there's an awful lot going out there. And it affects all of us as business leaders and as consumers. And today, we're going to discuss some of the more important ones coming up on our radar. All right. For today's issues, we thought we'd talk about infrastructure and how that affects your vendors as well as you. It's not just you. And this is one of the issues that you have to be aware with if you're going to be a functioning partner with your vendors. One huge example that we have here in California is that we have the Sacramento River Delta. It flows at 1,000 times the River Jordan in Israel. Israel gets all of their water needs out of the River Jordan, which really isn't a river, folks. It's a creek. It's a glorified creek, but it handles the nearly 9 million people there. Now, here in California, we have this river that is dumping a thousand times the River Jordan into the ocean, and it needs to handle roughly uh, three times the population of Israel. So what this proves is that in infrastructure, obviously the Israelis know how to handle water. Obviously, we know how to handle water, but we don't have the will. And this comes down to what do we do? Do we take a large industry like almonds, and it is a huge industry for California, do we tell them, I'm sorry, you use too much water, you're just going to have to do without, which is what we're doing now, basically. Or do we put pressure on government to spend money on the things that we need to keep us the fifth largest economy in, in, in the world and agriculture being such an important part of that economy. And think of yourself as an almond seller in some way, almond product. The vendor is, is some kind of a, a co-op that, that assembles it. Previous to that, it, it's a farmer. And then the farmer needs the water. So the, the vendor's Two layers up, the vendor's problem is your problem. And you really need to pay attention to what's going on because it's, it's, it seems to be a, a fairly universal problem. And it's, it also comes down to doing a little bit of homework, talking with your vendor to understand where they're getting their supplies from. Do they have a reliable supply? Are the farms that they are buying their almonds from? Quite simply put, are they going to be able to produce going forward. If you can understand that, if your vendor can understand that, and that's a little tricky at the, at the, at the moment, then you have to consider, do I, get my, do I get my supply somewhere else? Or is there something I can do to help my vendor 
do what he needs to do? Two separate questions, but vital. Okay, here, here's an issue that uh, we've been discussing for, for quite a while, and our listeners could file this one under unintended consequences. We've had a pandemic, and we've had hundreds of thousands of lives lost. And that's certainly a tragedy in, in a lot of ways. We not only have key workers lost, but we also have the wage earners and families lost. And that tremendously negative impact on, on families. But the impact goes further than that. It's just not the, the family, it's just not your current income, but it's also goes larger. U.S. life expectancy has fallen by 1.5 years since 2020. So that affects uh, life insurance claims, number one. It also affects the life insurance calculation because life insurance calculation is basically based on life expectancy. It also affects workman's comp rates because if, if you have a, a, an employee who's died in, in working at your company, even though you don't have anyone there who has been sick, you're probably likely going to get a death claim. The death claim is going to be a high rate and workman's comp and it's going to last for, th for three years or so. And if you don't like it, you can litigate, but you're litigating in an environment in which the employer is uh, typically wrong right from the get go. So you, you have problems there. You have problems with the life insurance rates and you have all the, the societal problems of people getting uh, of dying and the consequences of that. What we haven't seen yet are all the deaths that are coming from delayed medical care. I was talking to a pathologist the other day and he says, you know, when during the pandemic, we weren't that busy, but now we are and the cases we're seeing are substantially worse than we would have seen before. So the ability to affect the solution is, is less than, than what it would have been before. That will also affect life expectancy rates. That also affects families. It also affects uh, companies and other people involved. So the, the effect of the pandemic is yet to be seen in total. And this brings up the whole issue of the cost of uh, labor. What does it cost to hire people? And certainly what Doug has just outlined here, uh, it's obviously going to bring costs up. And you may be thinking to yourself, well, this is a temporary thing that uh, life expectancy will go right back up again uh, once this is all, all over. And, and that's probably true. But do you think the cost will go down? I seriously doubt it. I wouldn't count on it. So these, these labor costs are probably going to stick. Plus there's just, we all know the pressure that's being put on to raise minimum wage. And so many jobs in our economy are minimum wage. That is going to raise costs and which is going to raise prices. And that filters through the chain from your suppliers right to the retail floor all the way through each step of the way those costs are going to rise so uh, these are issues you need to pay attention to they do affect you are they permanent or are they temporary all questions that need to be answered if you're in the closely held space you have to realize you have less options you have less effectiveness to make changes to those things that are coming your way and so therefore you you need to be more creative and you need to be more on top of the issue than uh, perhaps a large public company who's just simply going to buy their way out of the problem if you're closely held you don't buy your way out of problems you have to find other solutions so word to the wise to be watchful If you're enjoying this podcast, wait till you get your hands on Doug's book, We Are Alpha Dogs, available on Amazon and wherever books, ebooks, and audiobooks are sold. Go to wearealphadogs.com for bonuses and downloads to help you and your company become legendary. And if you are especially adventurous, while you're at it, take the dog quiz and find out more about who you really are. Now, back to the Oval Table. Well, we are very pleased to have with us today, Mr. Gary McKinsey. 
Uh, Gary has a, has a fascinating background. In 1995, Gary received a congressional appointment to the White House Conference on Small Business and continues to this day in that capacity as the Associate Tax Chair for California. He has served three American presidents, Clinton, Bush 43, and Obama. He also has served on the Small Business Tax Advisory Council of the U.S. Chamber of Commerce. He has chaired the Northern California Leadership Council of the National Federation of Independent Business, which is recognized as one of the most effective small business lobbying organizations in Washington, D.C. In 2008, Governor Schwarzenegger appointed Gary to chair the tax committee for the Governor's Business and Entrepreneur Conference, so he became the taxinator. In January 2010, he launched a new business focused on working with business owners and entrepreneurs. He presents workshops to create a seven-step marketing plan and how to increase your business and your influence through personal networking. So you see, we have someone of outstanding accomplishment here with us today. So first of all, Gary, I just want to ask you, with all of your accomplishments, you obviously came from a wealthy, Upper East Side, well-connected family, and you probably graduated cum laude from Harvard Business School. Is that correct? Well, Carl, it's not quite correct. My uh, family was a working-class blue-collar family. In fact, my dad was an automobile mechanic, so it certainly, it certainly was not uh, well-connected or wealthy by any means. And I uh, graduated not from Harvard, but from California State University, Stanislaus. All right. So in your life, leading up to your service in Washington, D.C., what are the most important things you learned about creating and running a small business? You know, Carl, the main thing I learned about running a small business is staying focused, having a goal in mind, and working towards that goal, having a vision of what you want to create and working towards creating that vision and being persistent towards being tenacious. Tenacity is a, is a pretty necessary ingredient, isn't it? Absolutely it is. You have to be tenacious and dedicated because a lot of, you know, you're really, you're working 24 seven. Your mind is always thinking about the business and what can you do and what can you do better and how can you promote your business? Right. Okay. So, so just curious coming from a, um, from a small agricultural town in California's Central Valley, the town of Ceres. It's about uh, 20 miles south of Modesto, right? That's right. Correct. Growing up in that environment, what business perspectives did that give you? Well, Carl, growing up in that environment is mainly an agricultural community. The people got up, they went to work, and they worked hard every day. They were thrifty. They were ingenious and they were self-reliant. I think that's the main thing was self-reliance. They weren't looking for outside help. They did it themselves. They, when they had a problem, they figured out a way to solve that problem and they moved forward. So that, that's what I take from that, my background. You know, the relationship between business, especially small business and government, can be contentious. Yet we continue to build and maintain a strong business environment in this country. So what do you attribute that? And are there any clouds on the horizon for that relationship? You know, Carl, I, I contribute this really to the ingeniousness and the determination of that small business individual, that entrepreneur who is determined they're going to succeed regardless say, of the odds. And so they find out, they figure out a way to weave and work around legislative issues. That's, that's what I've noticed that be it, be it at the state level, the county level, the federal level, legislation is passed that we first look at it and think, wow, how can we handle this? And yet that small business owner is so adept at maneuvering that they See the challenge, and they will find a way around that challenge. That's the first step right there. They find a way to solve the problem themselves without really going back to the government. 
would you see government as a help or a, or a problem? The legislators, all of them believe they are helping. They all go to, whether it's going to Sacramento here in California or Washington, D.C., they will go with the idea, with the intent that they're helping. Yet the majority of them have never, ever ran a business. They've never made a payroll. They've never signed in front of a payroll check. They've never had to deal with cash flow. And so as a result, they pass legislation without really digging into understanding the consequences and how it impacts small business. So I, I would say their intent is good. However, quite often, the outcome is not what they expect, does not necessarily help small business move forward and achieve its goals. We have, we have the example of the senator in the Northeast who uh, passed all this legislation. And then when he retired from the Senate and opened a hotel, he realized how many obstacles he had put in in the way of his successful hotel. Right. He got on the other side of the fence. Yes. Right. But but uh, you see it as sort of unintended consequences, like like, like that very senator. That it's it's not an adversarial re- relationship. It's 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 just they don't know. Correct. Based on based on their academic information. It looks like what they're proposing ought to work. And yet, in reality, down here on the street, it does not work, or it doesn't work the way they're anticipating it's going to work. You know, what I I have found was you break through that by working with either an organization, like I did a lot of work and still do with the National Federation of Independent Business. You find a group of like-minded individuals that can focus on one piece of legislation that needs to be changed, and then, then you have to be persistent. You have to go to Sacramento, or you have to go to Washington, D.C. again and again and again and knock on the doors, meet with the legislators, explain what is taking place in, in your proposal. I mean, what's taking place now is negative. Your proposal to make things better and what they can do and how it's going to help their constituents. You have to be very important to explain how it impacts their constituents. If it's impacting their constituents negatively, we're certainly going to get their ear. And what we've discovered, I've discovered, is if we can find a constituent from their district that will give us a testimonial or give us some support, that is huge. As I, as a Californian, speaking to a legislator from New York, yeah, I'm a Californian. But if I can have a small business owner from New York with me or information with that person, now I've got their ear. Like there's a kindred spirit between small business people that is not necessarily tied to the region of the country that they happen to be operating in. In other words, you can take a small person or a small business person from New York and or one from Texas and put them in the same room. They may not have the same kind of business, but if they did... They might find they have more in common than they do separately. Would you agree with that? Well, I absolutely would agree with that. The issues are very similar. Sometimes the way they describe them are different. However, when you cut through the verbiage, the issue is similar. They have a very similar issue, very similar problems. So there there is that connection for sure. And when small business owners get together and speak with one voice, they are powerful. They can change legislation. Could you cite an example in in your career where you've seen that happen or you've been a part of making that happen? Yes. uh, When I attended the 1995 White House Conference on Small Business, there was over 2,000 small business owners there and representatives. And each group, each, like I was in the tax committee, we voted on issues that we felt were important. And the issue that I worked on mainly was the elimination of the death tax, or at least changing how a state tax. At that point in time, the estate tax, an individual could have passed $600,000 on to their heirs free of a state tax, or a married couple, $1.2 million. Yet, this was a problem. I'm going to make a broad statement. All small business owners were facing how do you pass this assets on to my children, on the next generation, without it being substantially reduced by a state tax? 
the number the number that our group was supporting in addition to the goals to eliminate it if we could not eliminate it bring it up to five million dollars per person or ten million dollars per family and that was the part that i worked on it took us numerous visits to washington dc visiting with various elected officials and yet ultimately in the bush administration and bear in mind this started out in the clinton administration in the bush administration we had one year where actually there was no estate tax no death tax however when it came back into effect we were at that five million dollars per individual so yes that was our that is uh, an example it took a lot of, <laughs> i'm chuckling here it took a lot of visits to washington dc and the, this small business group Vaughn, we went at our own expense. We were not paid. We took away time from our business. We went, we met three to four times a year, and we knocked on the doors of our elected representatives, and we ultimately got this legislation passed. So you, Gary, and your friends are the heroes of the estate tax. You've done a tremendous service because what you've done is you've saved the family farms. Correct. And that, I mean, these are people who work the farm every day. They're, they're multiple generations and they're doing difficult work, oftentimes mm -hmm. long hour work. And you save them from having to dispose of those farms upon the death of the uh, previous generation. It's a tremendous achievement. From a tax standpoint, that's a tremendous thing. And that was our goal. Mm -hmm. That was the goal to save it from the uh, federal taxation. Because usually, if you have a small business, and let's say the business is worth something more than the six hundred thousand, which was the previous limit. If you, if the the succeeding family members have to sell the business to pay the tax, then they don't have a business anymore. Maybe a business they've grown up in. A absolutely, and that was the goal. Was uh, they didn't have to sell the business or go into significant debt to pay the tax because. Is that reduced then the ability of that business to grow because it had all this debt it had to pay? Those businesses might not have the ability to service that debt. Oh, that's quite true because many, many small business owners, may, maybe their business on paper, on paper is worth $5 million or $10 million, but that doesn't mean they've got that type of cash flow to service the debt. It's all an asset, and a lot of it's in goodwill. And so, if you take take the the asset and the goodwill and tax it now they may well have to sell that business or they do not have the what we call the cash flow the ability to service the debt and they go out of business we've lost if we've lost a small business if you look at a, at a farm for example the the value of the farm is is based on the equipment and the value of the land correct but every year is not a great year in a farm in fact the, the maybe half the years are not great years they're break even type years and so in those years there is no ability to service that debt and that's so true and that's uh, what we're looking at uh, many of my clients and many of the individuals we worked with yeah you know, they are the farmers they've got land they've got assets that doesn't mean they have cash flow they do not have and they've got they've had crop crop disasters they have bad years so absolutely i can tell you the case uh, of my family that without that legislation that you got passed, we would have been decimated. And we, we, I would not own the businesses I own today had that not been passed. We probably would have had to li liquidate, put the money in the bank and what money was left over, and that w would have been it. Thank you, that's heartwarming to hear that story. Of course, the, the, the reality is, Gary, that there are millions of Carl's out there. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Your, are. your work has uh, had a tremendous positive impact. One thing I'd like to do is get into a discussion of the current tax proposals in which they're going to want to try and raise the capital gains uh, to a, a 40 some percent rate for those capital gains over a million, which of course includes farms, includes businesses, includes so many other things and many homes in California for that matter. So, uh, that seems to be a negative to the positive direction you had set up. Would you care to uh, opine on that? 
Yes, I believe the increase in capital gains rates, which is proposed, is really going to have a detrimental effect because individuals are going to choose not to sell their property. They're going to choose not, not to uh, engage in activities that would, would, in, would increase employment or increase the businesses. So I see a capital gains rate as a real drag on the economy because people do not want to pay higher taxes. Now I've got I've got clients right now that are considering liquidating some of their uh, assets. In fact, one's one one's a farmer right now because he said if I do it now, my I know my taxes, my maximum tax federal tax rate would be fifteen percent and twenty one percent. Of course, another eleven here in California. Put that together, that's a lot of money. But he thinks if I wait till next year, or the year after, it may be significantly more. And if he can't get his property sold this year, he's going to back off and not, not make that move. He's not going to pay the tax. And as we say, there are millions of business owners that have that same mindset. I think there's a sneaky provision in that bill that is going to move the effective date to April of this year so that you can't make any change now and get, a, uh, get out of that situation. And that is the scary part that Congress will enact laws and make it retroactive so that you cannot do that planning. One of, one of the goals of the Oval Table is to inform the closely held business owner of issues that are going on that are important to them that they may not necessarily be thinking about. Certainly in the current environments, inflation, supply chain problems, and other, other sorts of things, and then all these taxes issues that you've brought up. What we're trying to do is follow your lead, in essence, by uniting them and informing them so they're coming from an informed position and uniting them to be a voice uh, against some of these negative things that, that that people with no background and who have other, another axe to grind want to try and push through the system without regard to what the costs are to everyone else. So that's certainly one of our, our goals here at the Oval Table, and uh, your example of what you've talked about and what you've done in the past is, is certainly uh, inspiring. Thank you, Doug. Thank you. I was thinking that the consequence of some of the things that we've just finished talking about has a big impact on employment, because if you don't have a business, if you don't have businesses to employ people, then you don't have an employment, you don't have a, um, a, a rigorous um, a labor market. And those folks are now either drawing unemployment or they're having to make uh, substantial changes to their lifestyle. So in a sense, the, um, uh, the real loser in all of this is um, the average working person. The average working person loses and their communities lose. I think quite often they don't realize the, in any community, the small business owner, not as the employer, However, they're involved in the community. They're, they're involved in Girl Scouts and Boy Scouts and Chambers of Commerce and Little League. They're there. They're supporting it. You pull that support out, that's going to change, change the dynamics. It's going to change that level of uh, involvement. And it changes. I, I feel it's going to change entrepreneurism because those people will not see the impact that an entrepreneur has on the community since they won't, they won't be there. So I think there's a, an impact there that's really not being addressed. But that's a multi-generational impact. That isn't just a, this, this uh, presidential term impact. That's multi-generational in the future. And, and I agree, Doug. It, it is multi-generational. And, of course, that's the whole concept of uh, our oval table here. It is, it, it is precisely that. Uh, I don't think a lot of, sm of small businesses understand that their most valuable asset is their people. And they need to treat that asset as such. It's sort of the 800-pound gorilla in the room. Gary, you've counseled presidents. You've counseled three presidents. Three presidents with three very different agendas. Um, and I'm just uh, – I don't have a question as much as a, uh, a curiosity – about the conversations that you had with these presidents, if they took what you had to say to heart, and, and if you found the information that you gave them to be more um, objective 
or was that met with uh, some sort of a you know a, a, a filter through the the party, if you will? Depending on the president, some certainly um, was was met with the filter, no doubt about it. Absolutely was filtered. Others were somewhat on the same agenda, and we we're talking again about the benefits to the country, and in this case, the benefits to the country and the constituents. But, but all of it was filtered, there's no doubt about it. It was clearly being filtered by the party and by their, their beliefs. And you had to be aware of that going into the conversation. Were you able to turn any of those beliefs? I believe with uh, President George W. Bush, and essentially with the estate tax, where I was, that was my involvement. And, and, and again, I don't know coming into the conversation what his position was, but, but they were open, open to the conversation and to changing it. What's the one thing you really wanted that didn't get enacted? Well, in our group, with our, our list of tax proposals, we got them all enacted. Great. We got everyone enacted. Excellent. I, I will add what we're work, working on now, Carl, is we think there's time for another White House conference on small business. And we're, work, we're knocking on doors of the current administration, trying to get traction there. We, we did this with uh, Bush. We did not get any place with Obama. It did not, we could not get anyone interested in another White House conference, nor with Trump. We said, okay, you're dealing with small business people. We're using this word tenacious. We're, we're, we're still at it. And we're, we're going to pursue them again about another White House conference on small business. All right, great. Thank you so much, Gary. And please do do come back. There is so much for, for us to cover that we weren't able to get to today. And uh, I know our listeners are, are, are going to enjoy hearing you again. I would love to come back. Thank you so very much. Thank you. Wow, what a great conversation. Alpha Dogs are always the first in line for the good stuff. So remember to download your favorite episodes at theovaltable.com. Stay up to date by subscribing and review us on Apple Podcasts to let other top dogs know how much you enjoy these conversations. Now, let's go back to the Oval Table to hear what impressed the guys from the interview. Well, gentlemen, I thought that was a fascinating conversation with a fascinating individual. Can you imagine, I mean, being in a position where you get the opportunity to give your thoughts openly and candidly to a president of the United States directly? That must be just thrilling, even if the president is not um, uh, politically aligned with some of your thinking. It's still a, an honor and a privilege to do so, I would think. Doug, what else did you get out of that interview? Well, that's a couple of things that, that uh, Gary illustrated uh, Oftentimes people think that I can't do something big because I don't have big background. I didn't come from a great school. I didn't have a great family. And Gary is an example of the opposite of how he did great things, but he didn't come from Harvard. He didn't come from an East Coast school. He didn't go to Stanford. Uh, he, he went to Stanislaus, which is a Cal State college. He came from a very small town. And it didn't matter to him that those were factors in his background. He used those as strengths to go ahead and try and get something accomplished, and he did. One of the huge things he did was he he and some others working together was able to raise the estate tax exemption from 600000 to $5 million. That alone is, is so important that as a career maker in and of itself, that if he did nothing else in his career but that, that would be a tremendous contribution to everyone else's lives. The reason it's so important is that if you have a family farm, you have a lot of assets, you have very expensive equipment, but you don't have cash. So if dad dies and they cannot pass the, to the fifth generation, and many of these, these farms are fourth, fifth, sixth generation family operations, you're able, unable to pass it because the, the difference between, if, if you have an operation, if, you, if your estate tax exemption is 600,000 and, and the farm is worth 5 million, the difference between 600,000 and 5 million taxed at 
destroys the business. I mean, the family has to sell that farm. They can't continue to be there. So you can't have diversified food producers. Uh, you have consolidated corporations doing everything. So by raising it to $5 million, you're allowed to pass a business forward to, to people who are already in the business. And it isn't necessarily family. It can also be employees in the business that, that want to continue on and want to buy the business from the owner. So that alone is a very significant contribution that, that Gary has made. I think I might add to that also, if you live in one of the major cities in California, or if you live in New York City, and you have a home, even just a condominium, that $600,000 exemption that used to exist took you out of the game. You cannot pass that down to your to your children because, well, every home in a major city in, in the LA and New York area is well over that in fact you're you're probably up to close to a million uh for a uh, single residence a single family residence and um well above 600,000 on a on a on a condominium in fact we're going to in uh future weeks we're going to have a a farmer on someone who does do farming we'll probably tackle this issue with uh him what are your thoughts about the legislative process and how um, uh, a, a, you know, a group of advisors are put together to discuss small business from a practical, on the ground point of view with Congress and with their senators. What are your thoughts on Gary's comments regarding the legislative process? Well, one, one thing that Gary pointed out is that in his experience in dealing with uh, legislators, whether it's on the state level or the federal level, is that they're actually well-meaning and they actually want to help and they want to do something positive. The problem becomes is that there's two problems. One problem is they don't really know the area. They don't need to, to know the, necessarily know what they're, what they're legislating with. And so they really need to be, uh, to have a chance to learn from someone else uh, about that area. That's one thing. Uh, another thing is that in recent times, it seems that they don't read bills before they pass them. And no one would buy a, a car without reading the contract or leasing a piece of equipment without understanding the contract, understanding the terms. But that seems to be the norm. You have to pass the bill to find out what's in it was a, an expression that was used in the past. And so that's that's a negative. The second other thing that happens seems, seems to happen, according to Gary, is that uh, they come to, they come at a piece of legislation with a bias where it really doesn't matter necessarily what the fact pattern is. It doesn't matter what you're trying to tell them. It doesn't matter what the educational thing is you're trying to do. They have, they have a bias toward doing something and they see everything in terms of that bias. And so all they're doing is pushing the bias through. And we have examples right now in Congress with, where we have a very substantial bias and they're pushing ideas through, regardless of what the effect of those ideas might be. Well, I think you also have to look at it from the standpoint that the overriding priority for anyone in, in Washington is getting reelected. And they have to do what their con contributors need them to do, to do. And you can't blame them. That's the system. That's how they have to behave. Uh, a great ex example is uh, Ron Paul, if you remember him, a uh, congressman from uh, Texas. What he used to do is do things for his, not, not Rand Paul, Ron Paul, <laughs> the father. And um, uh, he used to do things uh, that his constituents wouldn't necessarily like, but he felt it was good for his constituents. So what he would do is draw up the uh, bill, get everybody else to vote for it with the understanding he was going to vote against it. But it was actually what he wanted. But he could always go back home and say, well, I voted against it. And that's the kind of game he had to, he had to play. Um, the other thing is what you uh, mentioned, Doug, no, none of them know everything about everything. They can't possibly do that. And finally, most of the bills are not written by the legislators. They're written by lobbyists. And the legislator does, 
doesn't really understand the language and everything that's in the bill. They didn't write it. Imagine what could happen if we had an oval table around that legislation, where we are actually sitting around with diversity of opinions, and we're assembling all those ideas before we do something. Uh, imagine how that would affect things. And that's what you need to be doing in your business is having an oval table around these issues. And that's what people like Gary are for. I got to throw this in because you just reminded me of, a, of a, an example of that occurring in a Washington setting. It was a movie. It was a movie and it was entirely made up. But um, it was the film with um, Kevin Klein where he was the uh, spitting image of the sitting president. And the sitting president was incapacitated to the extent that Kevin Klein was secretly brought into the White House to portray the president. And he had an oval table and got a piece of legislation through that really did do a good thing. He had all of the, the, the key senators and congressmen sitting at that table and made it happen. It just reminded me of that from an entertainment standpoint, Doug. We would be remiss in not mentioning also that Gary is an example of being tenacious, trying to push through legislation, going through it over years and years of, of effort to try and get legislation that makes a difference. He also said, if you're running a business, you have to be tenacious, be tenacious at working with customers, producing quality product and making that business successful. So Gary's an example of what it means to be tenacious. No podcast like ours would be possible without the help of some talented people behind the scenes. We would like to thank Audavita Studios and their director of podcast production, Sean Hedinger, recording engineer David Rosenblad, staging and show production David Wolf, social media Jay Spang, artist Marsha Carrington, and for our transcriber, Jamie Karras. We all hope you have a productive and inspirational week. I'm Rishi Katz. And we will see you next time here at the Oval Table.